Well, hello, and thanks once again for joining us tonight for Grace Church Online. As always, it is a fantastic a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, if you're in our local area with the weather getting a little bit chilly uh, once again, I hope you found a way to stay safe and warm and dry. Now, I wanted to uh, just give you a couple of updates if I can. The first of those is with regards to our building. And you may have heard us over the last few months uh, speaking out about uh, a building that we had been negotiating with uh, in the main street of Morissette, our local region. Well, sadly, uh, we didn't receive or we didn't get that particular building. So uh, we've submitted three offers. Now, our final offer wasn't accepted. Another organisation um, basically came in and uh, outbid us in, in essence. That's what actually happened. So um, all the very best to them in that building space. And uh, we're disappointed, of course, as a church, but we've got to believe that God is good. And if this is not the space that he has for us, then he has some Something better and so I just asked you to uh, keep praying for whatever that particular space is and for now when it comes to in-person gatherings we are meeting at our brand new location the multi-purpose center in Morissette it's at 143 Dora Street on the main street just opposite where the golf course used to be right next to the ambulance station so if you'd love to join us for an in-person gathering, 9.30 Sunday is when those gatherings will take place. Hey, our good friends at Thrive Madagascar, Brendan, who is uh, running that organization, that ministry, he's heading off to Madagascar and has just put a call out for a couple of things that they actually need. So they're looking for uh, laptops that are in good working order and also looking for smartphones that are in good working order. So if you happen to have one or both of those things and uh, you can donate them to Thrive Madagascar. Can you just make a note there in the chat function on your screen and we'll ensure that that information gets passed on uh, to Brendan and his team from Thrive. So uh, you might just have them lying around. I was thinking about it at our house and uh, we've got a couple of old smartphones, an old Samsung somewhere and uh, another one that really we're not using anymore. They're in a drawer somewhere. I don't even know where. That's how long it's been since we've used them, but they're still in good working order. So if you're one of these people that regularly updates their phones and uh, you don't hand down your old one, maybe sitting in a drawer, then uh, you could uh, donate it to Thrive Madagascar to help the team on the ground over there when it comes to reporting and uh, a bunch of things they need to do for Thrive. And I just want to talk about giving for a couple of minutes if I can, because I've been pondering giving this week because uh, in my family, we actually donated a few hundred dollars to a ministry that we didn't know too much about. We sort of stumbled across them, but really we uh, wanted to invest into them. We felt in God to sow in to them as a ministry. And I had to call them this week because I needed to get a receipt from them so I could claim it on my tax. And uh, when I spoke to a lady, her name was Phyllis, she was so very, very thankful that uh, we would sow into their ministry. It's only a fairly small ministry. Uh, its annual income is something like $25,000. And uh, she was just blown away. And she said, oh, you're such a legend, you know, for sowing in. And uh, made me feel good, I'll be honest. But that's not why we did it. We did it in obedience to God. And we know that when uh, we are generous, uh, whether that's us as a family, whether that's us individually or us as Grace Church, when we are uh, generous, then we know that there is a blessing to others. And there's a fantastic verse in Genesis chapter 12. It's verse 2. And uh, God speaking to Abram, he says, I will bless you and make your descendants into a great nation. And I think we can agree, we all would love to be blessed. And we'd all would love for our generations, you know, to be following God and to become that great nation of God. But then it goes on to say, you'll become famous. But listen to this and be a blessing to others, and be a blessing to others. So really, what God has said to Abram, as I have blessed you, I want you to go out and I want you to bless others. And he's saying the same thing to you and to me. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing. It's not all for us. Obviously, we want to take care of our families and those sorts of things. But we also want to make sure that our, uh, our, our posture, our default is that of generosity. So as we are blessed, we can bless others. Because the truth is, we've been given the privilege to resource the work of the kingdom. God doesn't need our money. But he wants us, he wants you, he wants me, he wants us collectively as the church to be obedient to his word, to his call when it comes to our finances and our giving, 
but also to partner with him to further the kingdom of God. And I just never want to forget that. I never want to get to a place where I'm only giving out of obligation because uh, it's much more than that. It comes out of relationship, but God is using you and me and his church to further his kingdom here on earth. I'll let you ponder that as uh, we get ready to head into a time of worship. And it's a song called Raise a Hallelujah. It's been around for a while, so you might know it. But there's a fantastic verse from Psalm 105 that really speaks into this. And I just want to share that with you as we get prepared for a great word from Pastor Jackie. Here's what it says. Hallelujah, thank God, pray to him by name. Tell everyone you meet what he has done. Sing him songs, belt out hymns, translate his wonders into music. Honor his holy name with hallelujahs. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive.
Yes, I believe you are the Son of God, willing as a king to die upon the cross. But you didn't say inside that grave, no one else has done the same. Jesus, I confess, your Lord of my life. I choose to say yes to your ways, not mine. No more running, no more searching. You're the only one for me. And no turning back won't change my mind.
last time I shared this message, clear oil for the lamp. And together we looked at the theme that flows right through the Bible of grace versus law. And I focused in on the Old Testament story of Eli the priest, Hannah and Samuel. And we've been looking over a number of messages, so not just that last message, but a number of messages we've continued to look at how God has called out or set apart people in the, um, for his kingdom purposes, okay? And so throughout all of the generations that have gone before, and including us, God has continued to call out or set apart people. And it's primarily for his kingdom plans and purposes. And I love that through that, we get to see his heart for humankind. Because as I've shared many times before, God's heart is that all people will be reconciled back to him. And you find that from the start of the Bible all the way through until the end in Revelation. That is what the Bible is about. That all people would be reconciled back into an intimate relationship with him. So last time we looked at the Father's heart. The Father's heart. Our beautiful God's heart. It's a central theme, as I shared before. And how he uses ordinary people just like you and me. And there are prophetic patterns and prophetic words in the Bible that all lead back to that same thing. That God's beautiful heart wants people in a right relationship with him. And those prophetic words and patterns continue to point people to Jesus. In Romans 10, verse 9 to 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So God's heart is that every man, woman and child would be in a relationship with him. That people would personally accept Jesus, his son. And so at that point of salvation, and a lot of us here have, have come to that point of salvation, a person moves from eternal death, a forever life without God, and into a forever life with God, which we know as eternal life. It's at that very point of salvation where the Bible tells us there, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart. That's how simple God has made it for us. And it's an amazing gift that God's given to us. And it's irrespective of anything good and it's irrespective of anything bad that I do. Salvation is not about behaviour. Salvation is a gift given to us by our beautiful God. We can't earn salvation. Instead, salvation is all based on the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. As he fulfilled the, the righteous requirements of the law, the old covenant of the law, Jesus' sacrifice is salvation. We can't earn it. And all we need to do, as we just read in that scripture in Romans 10, is confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. And then God bestows on us this amazing, beautiful gift of salvation. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And I love that. Because even at the point of salvation, when we move from that eternal death into eternal life, it wasn't anything about me. It was a gift I received. 
It's that none should boast, I'm so good, I received that salvation. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with our beautiful Jesus. We accept, confess, and believe, and it's given to us. It's a gift, a beautiful gift that none can boast. So we know that after Jesus died and rose again, a new covenant was established with God. The old covenant of the law passed away and the new covenant of grace began. So when Jesus died, rose again, a new covenant was established. And it's from that point that every generation from that point when he died and rose again, every generation from that point are now living under grace. Old, finished. When he died and fulfilled the law and he rose again, from that point, grace, a new covenant of grace entered in. And so that means that us today, we live under the new covenant of grace And sometimes we want to jump back over here under law and try to fulfill the requirements of the law. But we're not Jesus. And if we try to do that, we're trying to take away from the amazing, perfect sacrifice of Jesus by trying to fulfill, if I do good works, if I do good works, if I do good works, I'm going to earn my salvation. That's not under the covenant of grace. We want to do good works because of the amazing gift that we've been given and out of our heart and our relationship with Jesus, we want to do good works, but I can't earn my salvation. That scripture is very clear. Saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. So I want to encourage you, if you're not quite sure about grace, you've just been learning it for a little while. Some of us have been under grace, learning about grace for many, many years, and it's become embedded in their spirits. They understand it. But for some that are just new, been coming lately, I want you to get a hold of the amazing gift of grace that we live under. So today we're going to revisit, as I shared, that Old Testament story of Eli the priest, Hannah and Samuel, found in uh, 1 Samuel, or 1 Samuel. Now, this story is an Old Testament story, so it takes place under the old covenant of the law. Many, 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 many generations before Jesus was even alive. So this is an old covenant um, of the law story from the Old Testament. So Eli, um, the priest, he was part of the Levitical priesthood and he was the high priest and we shared about that last time. And he was high priest in a particular time in history where Israel um, Israel were not close to God. So we know in their history they're, they're close to God, they're not close to God, they're close to God, they're not close to God. And in that particular time when Eli was the high priest, um, Israel were far from that intimate relationship with God and we talked about last time that the priests were the ones who were set apart. We talked about set apart, being called apart, called out by God. And they were set apart by God for a dual purpose, to represent the people to God and to represent God to the people. They were also called to tend to the rituals of the temple, the place where the presence of God dwelt. Okay, so they had a lot of things to do within the temple and they were called apart from all of Israel as the priesthood to tend to the holy things of God. And each of these rituals were very specific and it was important that the priests followed the details of the law perfectly because if they didn't, they could die. Now, this seems really harsh, and what we know of God under the new covenant of grace is that he's a loving heavenly father, and we look at that, and we look under the old covenant, and we say, wow, who is this angry God that would, a priest could die just for doing something wrong? 
But we need to realise that it was under the old covenant of the law and Jesus had not yet come and become the mediator, our high priest, and has, has um, come and taken the place so that we can come close to God. So that's not God under the new covenant. Yes, he is the same God, but the judgment didn't come because God was angry. The judgment in that place where, where the priest could die is because of God's holiness. I want you to understand that. Because nothing that is tainted or unclean can come close to God. And so if a priest messed up and he did something wrong, didn't follow the specific instructions of the law, then an unclean thing came close to a holy, perfect and righteous God. And no unclean thing can come before God. And the amazing thing about that church, I want you to get a hold of this. The amazing thing about that is that we are able to stand before God in that most intimate place in a personal way because of the blood covering of Jesus. That's the only way us as sinners can come into right relationship with a holy God because of the blood covering of Jesus. So when we ask Jesus into our heart, God sees that personal um, belief and confession with your mouth, belief in your heart. He sees that and he sees Jesus in you and he says the blood covering is enough. His sacrifice is enough so that you may now draw close to a holy God. Where before a priest, if he did the wrong thing and he didn't come in the right way, because of his uncleanness, the holiness of God cannot come near anything that is tainted or unclean. So it's Jesus' perfect sacrifice, his blood and his broken body, that opens the way for believers to gain access to a holy God. And I know I am so thankful for that. Because otherwise, myself alone could never come close to a holy God. But with Jesus in me, I can come close to him and fellowship with him. And that's God's heart. That's why he sent Jesus his heart is that all of humankind could experience that intimate relationship. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body. So if you think about the tabernacle and the curtain that separated the tabernacle into, into parts, what that scripture is saying, that a new and living way, not a, not a way where the priest could die, but a new and living way is opened up for us through the curtain. No longer remember at the cross the curtain was ripped, but not through a physical curtain, but through the curtain that is Jesus' broken body. He stands in the gap so that we can enter into that most holy place. So last time we looked briefly at the temple and the different parts that make up Moses' um, tabernacle. And I'm not going to go into it into detail as I have before in previous times, but that is the holy place. And you can see right at the back there, that purple um, curtain that was torn when Jesus died on the cross. And behind that curtain is the Ark of the Covenant, which is a, a beautiful, ornate, golden box. Okay? And on top of that is a lid called the mercy seat, which I'll share about a bit later. But what I want to talk about are those three pieces of furniture inside the holy place, in particular the menorah, the seven-branch lampstand. And I talked a little bit about it last time, but I want to focus in more detail on the priest's responsibility of maintaining that lampstand, that menorah. 
And so we'll reread again um, from the book of Leviticus all those specific detailed instructions that God gave Moses on how to treat the holy things, the sacred things of the temple. Leviticus 24, verse 1 to 4. The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning continually. Outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant Law in the Tent of Meeting. Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning continually. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended continually. And you can see that I've underlined that word continually. Continually. In each of those verses, there are, it appears once. In each of those three verses, there are three continuallys. And three is a really important number in the Bible. I'm not going to go into it today, but it's important to know that whenever there's a three, it's complete. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a complete perfection, unity. And so what God is telling us is that continually, 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 is the per- perfect order. So in Hebrew, the word continually, as I shared last time, is tormid, which means uninterrupted continuity, never ceasing, perpetual. And as we read in Leviticus, the priests were the ones to maintain the temple lamps with oil in an uninterrupted continuity so that the light would not go out. There was to always be light within the temple. And the menorah lamp in the temple, each, each one of those um, pieces of furniture in the temple are representations of Jesus. They're there to show us something about Jesus. And they're really, really interesting. If you have a heart to search and dig and research and find out, they're really, really interesting. Every part of it has a meaning, how they're decorated, what they're made out of, how many uh, stems there are. So there's seven um, branches of the menorah. Each one of those things tells us something beautiful about Jesus. And the light was to be maintained continually. John 8 verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus, that menorah, God is showing us something about the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, it says there in that scripture. And Jesus calls us as the church, as his disciples, to also be the light of the world. As followers of Jesus, we are to be the light of the world in the same way that God is showing us in the temple. Here is the light. Jesus is the light. He says it himself. I am the light of the world. And as his followers, as his disciples, as the church, we are to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So the priests were instructed to maintain the lights with uninterrupted continuity. And us as the church, God is calling us as the church, instructing us as the church to continue to be that light. We have been assigned the duties of maintaining the light from the time Jesus ascended to heaven from the new covenant until he returns for us in the clouds and returns for his church and his bride. We are called, set apart as priests. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment as disciples of Jesus, to maintain the light. 
The church have been called and set apart as priests to be the light in the darkness of this world in an uninterrupted continuity. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 to 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The church is called to be like that lampstand. And we as the priests, as it says there, we are a royal priesthood, a people of God, set apart to be light in the darkness. God's special possession, it says there in that scripture. I love that I'm God's special possession. Me and God are like that. <laughs> Intimacy with the holy God because of Jesus. Another interesting prophetic pattern is that um, we read about it in Genesis. Is the very first thing that God spoke into creation was light. Genesis 1, verse 3 to 4. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Can you see the prophetic pattern of God has set into motion from the very beginning of creation, the very first thing that he spoke was, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness. And he shows us again that pattern where he has the lamp in the, the tabernacle and he's setting apart the darkness with the light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Church, we are the light of the world. We are to be that separation. Light separated from the darkness of the world. So from the beginning of creation, light has been shining continually. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is a holy God. He is the Father of lights. There is no darkness in Him. Jesus is the light of the world and He lives inside of you. Jesus is the good and perfect gift from the Father. And Jesus has always been the plan. To confirm this again, we read in Revelation that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. We know that there's many names of God, named that Jesus is known as many different names. Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I love that scripture. Because from the very beginning when God spoke, let there be light, I am the light of the world, Jesus says. From the Alpha and the Omega. Now, if you don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew, in Greek, the first letter is Alpha. And the last letter in the Greek alphabet is Omega. And in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph is the first letter and Tav is the last letter. And Jesus is known as both. Alpha and Omega, or the Aleph Tav. And what does that mean? Now we think about the letters in the alphabet, okay? It means that everything ever written or anything ever spoken from the beginning of the world and until the end of the world is encapsulated 
Think about the alphabet. Anything you ever thought, ever, ever spoke, ever wrote is encapsulated within the person of Jesus because he is the alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. Every word you could write with the alphabet, every word that you could speak with the alphabet, that's Jesus. He is in everything. It's encapsulated in him. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the word of God. And you can't write words or speak words without an alphabet. Jesus Jesus is in everything. He is encapsulated in everything. I am the light of the world. From the beginning when God spoke, let there be light. I am the light of the world. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Word of God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I love that. Just such an amazing picture. That the Word of God, everything that is contained in the world that God spoke in, into existence, everything that's contained in your Bible came into the world in the body of Jesus. The Word became flesh. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. He didn't come full of law. He came to fulfill the law, to fulfill the scriptures in flesh. So the light has been shining from the beginning and will continue to the end. From the Alpha and Omega, the light of the world is shining in the darkness. And it was also the same, to be the same in the temple that we just talked about. God wanted the separation of light from darkness. And as we said, that menorah is the representation of Jesus. And further to that, we know that the church is to be the separation of light and darkness on this earth. As carriers of God's presence, we are to bring the light to the world. And I've shared this a little bit before, but it's actually going to be quite a worrying or anxious or stressful time when the light, the church, is removed from the world in the rapture. When Jesus returns for his church and the church is removed, the light of the world is removed from the darkness Those that are left behind will only be in darkness. The light will have been separated. It's not something I would want for anybody. Only darkness will remain. Once the church is raptured, the church age is over, the light is gone. It's going to be quite a a difficult time for people left behind when there's only darkness. But in our Old Testament story that we've been sharing here about Eli the priest, we learn that the light in the temple was not being maintained continually. And this is kind of reflecting back on the relationship that Israel had at the time. When the high priest was close to God and things were running how they were supposed to and they were following the specific directions and Israel was close, they had a good high priest and Israel was close, then things were good. But at this point in time where Eli was the high priest, they weren't and, think, and people were um, not following the specific instruction and bringing disgrace. So let's read in 1 Samuel 3 verse 1 to 4. 
The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So you get a hint at what's happening at that particular time in history. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel. I'm not going to read all of it, but then Samuel, um, the Lord calls Samuel three times and he runs to Eli. Yes, yes. And then he realizes that it's God talking to him. And he goes and asks God and God speaks to him. Now, to backtrack a little bit, we talked about last time I shared about the name Samuel. And Samuel, um, his name comes from some words in Hebrew, Shem, which means name, and El, which is God. So it can be name of God or hearer of God. So in the story, remember we're following this theme of grace versus law. And God continues to show us. Remember, this is an old covenant story, Old Testament story. So Samuel and Eli, let's look at them now. So Eli represents in that story the old covenant of the law. And Samuel, who was birthed from Hannah, Hannah meaning grace, his mother was Hannah. He was birthed, Samuel was birthed from Hannah, birthed from grace. So Samuel is a representation of the new covenant of grace. So Eli, the high priest, the old ways under the old covenant of the law, and Samuel representing the new covenant of grace. So under the law there, we can read about Eli. He's old and weary. Can we agree with that? One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. Now, remembering that under the covenant of the law, everything had to be done specifically to, us, to detailed instructions. What was Eli doing lying down in the temple? He should not have been there to begin with. So we know that Eli had fallen asleep on his job. Let's put it that way. And this is contrasted with Samuel, who is a young boy, a youth, and his name means name of God, and that Shem can also mean hearer or sound. And in the story, Samuel hears the voice of God three times. We know he runs back to Eli, what's happening? What? Then he said, no, it must be God. And then God speaks to him. So his name, Samuel, name of God, hearer of God, tells us there's a difference between Eli, who's falling asleep at the job, who's a bit weary in what he's doing, his eyes are becoming weak. And here we have this youth who is hearing the voice of God. So they are contrasted together as law versus grace. Now, remembering that Samuel was birthed from Hannah. Hannah means grace. And Samuel's name, as I said, is Shem El in Hebrew. Samuel, Shem El. Shem is the word for name, name of God. And in Bible times, the name, someone's name was linked to their character. So we can read some of the funny names in the Bible where maybe they caused, you know, through the birth, wasn't an easy birth, so they name them, you know, something that's not so good. Um, and the names are really important to God. He declares something over someone. So they're linked with the description of their character. So what it's telling us is that Samuel's name, name of God or hearer of God, is linked to something, to a description of their character. So Samuel is linked to God. Linked to the name of God, linked to hearing, linked to God's sound. So what is God's sound? Throughout the whole Bible, we hear of God's sound. God's sound is mercy. The mercy of God is from the beginning to the end. The mercy heart of God. And I read it earlier in that scripture. 
Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. As children of God, you have received God's mercy that none should boast. So God's sound is mercy. And I love that Samuel heard God. And what did he hear? He heard God's heart. He heard the sound of God. And we can look back in Genesis again. So God first reveals his sound, that mercy sound in the Garden of Eden when sin entered the world. The punishment for sin is death. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, because God is a holy God, they should have been put to death. The Bible talks about that the punishment for sin is death. So by the law, the old covenant of the law, Adam and Eve should have been put to death. But instead, we learn of God's sound, God's mercy. Because God didn't put them to death. God covered them. He covered their sin. He covered them with animal skins. He covered them with the blood and the, the sacrifice of another. And that's what he does for us. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, should have, according to the law, been killed. But God instead, with his sound, with his mercy, covered Adam and Eve with the sacrifice of an animal. It says he's clothed with animal skins. Genesis 3 verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I would have, I just think that must have been the most amazing time. You hear the sound of the Lord walking. What is the sound of God? His mercy. Genesis 3.21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So God again reveals his sound. His sound that Samuel Heard. What is the sound of God? That mercy. He came running and hearing. And it comes under the covenant of grace. That none should boast. We receive God's mercy through his son. And we can draw near to him. So again, God reveals his sound. There's many patterns throughout the Bible of God revealing his sound, that mercy. But when the veil was torn at the cross... God again revealed his sound, revealed his heart. Because when the veil was torn from top to bottom, it fell to either side, if you can picture it that way. And what was left standing there was the Ark of the Covenant. But not even the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was God's mercy seat. And it's always cleansed with the blood of an animal. So what God did when he tore that veil from top to bottom, he revealed his mercy. He ripped it when Jesus died on the cross and said, here is my mercy. What is the sound of God? His mercy. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there are three different things. And each one of them, so there's that number three again. Each one of them represents the law. But church, they're inside the box. Those that stand in the throne room cannot see the law. They cannot see those three things of the law. As you enter into the throne room of God, you cannot see what's inside that gold box. Those three representations of the law. So there's the Ten Commandments on, on um, tablets of stone, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod as the high priest. Those are three representations of the law, that completeness of the law inside the box. But church, we can't see inside the box. All we can see 
is the mercy seat of God. The law has passed away. Complete in the three, hidden away. The law has passed away. And what we are left with is the mercy, heart of God as we stand in his throne room before a holy God who we could never have come close to before. And who is the curtain? We read it earlier. The curtain that we enter through into that holy place is Jesus. It's his body that was broken and his blood covering that allows us to enter into that intimate space with God. Hosea 6 verse 6 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I love that scripture. Jesus actually, that's from Hosea, which is in the Old, Old Testament. But Jesus actually spoke it quite a number of times in the gospel. If you knew this scripture, he says to people, then you would not have condemned people. If you knew this scripture, if you knew the heart of God, if you knew the mercy of God, you will not be doing what you are doing. That's what he says a number of times in, in the gospel. He revealed the sound of the Father as he walked here on earth. He revealed the mercy heart of the Father. And that word knowledge, so it says, and the knowledge of God. We think that's about just knowing something I, I know of God. It's not there's so much more in the Hebrew. It's yada in Hebrew. That word knowledge in that particular scripture and the knowledge of God. It means to know, acknowledge, acquaint, comprehend, intimate friends. So what's God saying? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire this heart relationship, not the offerings under the law. I desire this heart relationship and the knowledge of God, that intimacy of friends, rather than burnt offerings and sacrifice under the law. That's our beautiful Abba. That's our daddy God, that people under the old covenant never, ever got to know. That's the amazing thing about grace. That's the heart of our God toward all people. That we would know him intimately. That we would be able to stand boldly in his throne room and receive his mercy. Because of Jesus, that's the only way we can receive his mercy is through Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much once again, Pastor Jackie. What a great word that was tonight. And it's one of those things, whenever my wife shares, because she uh, does a lot of research and she uh, spends a lot of time with God and it comes out of that, I always feel like I am stuffed once uh, she's shared. And it's a little bit like, you know, when you have your favorite meal and maybe you have one or two mouthfuls too many and you kind of just sit there and you're feeling a bit over full and you've got to take some time to digest it. That's exactly what tonight's message is like. I think over the days and maybe even the weeks to come as you're digesting that, as you're sitting with God in his presence and allowing his spirit to speak to you, there's going to be little nuggets, little treasures that will come out of that. And I know she's not finished when it comes to that thought as well. Uh, she's got something like 20 extra pages that uh, she hasn't even shared yet. So uh, she'll be back in a few weeks to continue that thought. Hey, don't forget that you can join us in person Sundays, 9.30 a.m. at our new location. The Multipurpose Centre in Morris at 143 Dora Street, just next to the ambulance station. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there if you can join us 9.30s on Sundays. Or make sure you join us 7 o'clock next Tuesday evening. We've got a special guest speaker who's going to speak uh, a great challenging word. Uh, that's next Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Try and stay warm. Try and stay safe. Know that you are highly favoured. Know that we love you so very much here at Grace Church. We're thankful for your company and we look forward to seeing you again next time. <music>